Hopefully it's on the right page. It got really quiet really fast. <laughs> Thank you guys. All right, well, good morning. I'm Burke Henda. On behalf of the Orange Chamber of Commerce, welcome to our February installment of Eggs and Issues. Today we have a very special guest, but I want to remind you guys, um, thank you first of all so much for coming, but breakfast is always delicious here. Enjoy your breakfast, but our guest is here for you. So if you have any questions, please feel free to just signal me, raise a hand is perfect. We want to make sure and get all of your questions answered, of course. And with that, I will introduce our special guest. Today I have with me Larry Dick. Good morning. I know that most of you all here know him. I heard the chatter beforehand, but I'm going to go ahead and just read his very brief bio for anyone who is watching or anyone who is here who does not know anything about Larry. So Larry Dick was elected to the Municipal Water District of Orange County, or MODOC. Board of Director is in November 2000 and has been re-elected five times. He represents Division Two, including the cities of Garden Grove, Orange, Tustin, Villa Park, and unincorporated North Tustin. Director Dick has been active in the Orange Water Orange County water community since the 1990s when he was first selected as a board member of the Serrano Water District and Serrano Water District Recreation Incorporated. He has served on the executive board of the Orange Chamber of Commerce as a board member of the Santiago Canyon Foundation and as a member of the board of directors of the Orange County Taxpayers Association. He is currently a board member of the Urban Water Institute, a member of the Association of California Water Agencies and of the Water Advisory Committee of Orange County which he has shared. He is also a member of the American Legion Post 0132. Director Dick has worked to protect Orange County Special Districts, serving on the Executive Committee of the Independent Special Districts of Orange County. He is also a senior member of MODOC's representatives on the Metropolitan Board of Directors, where he has served since 2003. And I know you were very, very busy with all of these groups. So thank you again for being our guest this morning. Thank you. Well, water. We need safe and reliable water. So tell us, I guess, give us a little bit of like a backstory of like what it is that you do and kind of where we are. Well, I, uh, I've got a problem. Okay. Uh, I see the general manager and the president of the Serrano board are here. So they're be all testing me for veracity. <laughs> <laughs> kind of tightens the latitude I normally have with an audience. Okay. Uh, the city of Orange is a great city. Uh, I live in it uh, as grew our our family grew up here. Uh, and Orange is in, in a good position for water. Your water department in the city of Orange is well run, and they are city, the citizens of Orange get water from the city. Uh, some get, from, get it from Serrano in East Orange, okay. and a handful get it from Golden State. Uh, the Orange County Water District uh, provides the opportunity to pump water from the ground. Uh, it's a very well run district. Uh, it's recognized throughout the world for the work they do, and recharging the basin uh, with recycling water. Okay. Uh, the board to which I have the privilege to be elected to is uh, responsible for bringing imported water into Orange County. Uh, many of you may know that about half the water we use in Orange County comes from outside of Orange County. We get it from the State Water Project down the aqueduct, 700 miles, and uh, I think it is the most productive of hydropower in the nation. And then we have a 242 mile aqueduct coming out of the Colorado River up at Parker Dam. That covers uh, five different pumping stations carrying the water up and over the mountains. And uh, I love numbers. Uh, There's 1,600 feet they've got to lift and carry that water. Okay. A gallon of water weighs 8.3 pounds. We can move like a million acre feet a year. That's like 3 billion pounds. That's a lot of energy. So when you're in the water business, you're in the electricity business, you're in the energy business. About 19% of the electricity in the state is used to move, treat, or dispose of water. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> the Municipal Water District of Orange County uh, takes care of that imported water dimension for the city of Orange and the county. Uh, they get that from the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. Metropolitan was uh, enabled, uh, had enabling legislation in the state of California in the early 19, or late 1920s, and uh, is, is the largest uh, drinking water agency in the United States, serving 19 million people. Water in Southern California is part of the economic engine, and it has to be recognized for that. The Chamber of Commerce is a 
big part of the work that's been done in helping getting appropriate legislation passed through the years. And so for the Water District, thank you and thank the Chamber. You're welcome. Is that good? That's good. Okay. <laughs> my you, can't, you can't leave yet. <laughs> when I left the house, my wife, I know she was thinking, don't, don't embarrass me. <laughs> You're doing good so far. Okay. <laughs> we have a little bit to go though. All right. Um, so I was looking through some of the, the top issues at, you know, at MODOC, and I noticed that you guys recently had your water policy forum and dinner. Mm -hmm. I think that was just a couple weeks ago, <coughs> um, honoring the late general manager, Rob Hunter. So we send our condolences <coughs> to his family and to your team. But can you tell us about that dinner? I saw there was a panel. I actually watched the panel a couple of times. But if you can kind of, like, tell us about that. Like, does that happen every year? Like, what is that normal our, to have Our a policy panel? dinners, um, we have a goal of, of three a year about okay. approximately every four four months excuse me <coughs> and generally we have the chairman of the metropolitan water district or the gm of the metropolitan water district come and speak to us one of those okay in this case it was the uh, newly elected chair yes. don ortega mm -hmm. is uh is from the city of fullerton he represents the city of uh, san fernando uh, and he brought uh, together a group of people to talk about uh, Rob and how Rob had had an impact on water in Orange County and in the state for that matter. We hired Rob <coughs> about 10 years ago from, uh, excuse me again, <coughs> from the city of Atlanta where he'd been water commissioner. Uh, there was some concern about the decision to hire him because it had been the, the, the dictate uh, at all prior hires that anybody that was hired to be a general manager in a water district in California had to know California water. The western state's water laws are arcane, if that's the proper word. Okay. Uh, but Rob came in with a deep thirst uh, for learning about that and a great background in management and a great background in understanding people and their needs and just did a cracker check job. I noticed you said deep thirst. Are there a lot of water jokes? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, we got some water dogs over here. Uh, the ladies that are involved are water lilies. Okay. <laughs> I love that. Okay, that's awesome. Okay, very cool. Well, as you mentioned, MODOC is um, the imported wholesaler for Orange County. What other services and programs do they provide? Well, we're pretty proud of the work we do. Anybody that knows me knows that I'm cheap. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, my Not wife. Seconding that I see over there. My, my wife knows that, you know, I don't think I'd pay a quarter to watch a, an ant eat a bale of hay. I just, I, it, it, as exciting as that might be for the entomologists, it wouldn't do it for me. I, I'm cheap. Uh, and I like to get value for a dollar. Did you miss the water district of Orange County, MODOC? What do we get at, at dollars and cents from you, the ratepayer? We get $13.75 per meter per year. That's what we cost you. In return for that, we do the administrative work to bring you the imported water. We also have a water use efficiency department, which has been very well run by a chap named Joe Berg. And we have brought in more money from grants, both state and federal, than we have cost. So we may not be a profit center mm -hmm. if because we're a, a nonprofit organization, but we bring in more than we take from you. So that should be hopefully hopefully make you feel good. What do we do in addition to that with that money? Uh, we help fund We Rock, the water emergency response of Orange County. Uh, we Rock uh, kind of sounds like a radio station as we've joked about in the past. But it does help us represent water on the emergency uh, <coughs> basis in the county. Mm -hmm. There's the Orange uh, Emergency Management Group, yes. uh, police, <coughs> fire, sheriff's department, public health. Uh, water has a seat at that table now through We Rock. Uh, okay. Trust me, when the firefighters go to work, they like having water at hand. They do. When public health goes to cure uh, issues, they need water. Mm -hmm. uh, we're delighted that we're a part of that. We have the water use efficiency thing that I mentioned earlier. We're, one of my favorite dimensions there is we've invested in the equipment that will do leak detection. It's expensive and learning how to, how to take care of it is expensive and learning how to use it takes training. We've got uh, two different teams that know how to use it. Uh, we have the equipment. 
So each district and city in Orange County is allowed to contract with that group so they don't have to hire their own, they don't have to have their own equipment, and we can help find leaks. When you find small leaks, they're easier to fix than big leaks. When you find a number of small leaks, the people that pay for the water actually get the water. It's a win-win situation. Some of the larger cities and larger uh, districts have their own teams, Okay. but it's something that we've been able to do now, and I'm just, I'm really excited about that. Yeah, I saw that on your website. I, I think I saw like you had announced some of the analytics, I guess it's been around since around 2019, and some of those were posted, I think, maybe around September, just like how great that has been in helping customers and consumers save money. Um, it, I know you mentioned numbers. It, it's people, an investment like, that will yeah. pay back. Can you put like a dollar amount to it? Like what would you think the average person's like saving by having that type of technology for you know, a business? I don't know. Okay. Uh, I do know that the uh, districts that have employed the service thus far right. uh, will get a payback normally within, I'll look now to Jerry, two or three years? Two I think years. that's about right. And uh, certainly I can get that information for you. We'll put it in the newsletter. Happy yeah. to do it. Awesome, thank you. Well, we are with the business community, and I do want to make sure, does anyone have any questions come to mind just yet? <coughs> yes, Bill. I have a question, but first a plug for the chamber. And the chamber is, I have met Larry Dick, as a number of us have, have met each other over the years on the board of the chamber, some, as you mentioned, back in the year it was now, and uh, it's just kind of great people that we see. I do have a, a question. Of, of Larry's been talking primarily about wet water, I believe, and so, there's other kinds of water, we know paper water, and I understand there's a, another type of water, virtual water. Can you touch on that at all? Or oh, So the question's you. about virtual water, I'd love to hear about this. Well, let me tell you. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Wet water is what you've got in your coffee or your glass, right? We, okay. all, we all have that. There's paper water. Uh, for example, the state of Arizona has been stocking up on water because, you know, Arizona's a pretty hot, dry state. Anytime they got a chance, they would put water away in the ground, storing it for the future, kind of like, you know, what you, what you always appreciate when water districts do. One of the problems they have, they've done a crackerjack job of putting that water away. They've done such a wonderful job, they don't have the ability to take it all back out. Okay. Uh, they'll have to invest more in infrastructure, additional wells and, and pipes and things. So they've got the water, but it isn't wet water. It's paper water. It's there, but they can't put it in a glass. That's paper water. And we've got some of those issues in here. I mean, we can say we've got a million acre feet in storage, but if we only have the pumping capacity to extract half that, then it's paper water. Mm -hmm. Virtual water <coughs> creates a lot of discussions around. Uh, the example I use most often is alfalfa. If, if you know anything about farming, which I think is a fascinating industry. Alfalfa is fodder. It's what you use for silage. It's how you feed livestock. Okay. Racehorses, uh, dairy cows. Some people think that we should not allow farmers in this part of the world to use water on alfalfa because it's a thirsty crop. Others say, well, you shouldn't be doing that because then we export the alfalfa to Japan. So we're exporting water. And that is virtual water. Now that's a discussion that has to be taken because in some cases we have laws about exporting water out of a watershed. Is that breaking the law when you do that? I don't think so, but some people might contend that that could be a perspective. Uh, when you're a Japanese firm buying our alfalfa, I contend that they're really renting our dirt because there's not much land for farming in Japan. Right and they have livestock that they need to feed, and they do it with our alfalfa, great. Uh, Saudi Arabia, they buy that for resources and other things. They've got plenty of area, but not so much water. So they may be buying our water. But what the farmer's getting is a cash crop every month. Now this is the Chamber of Commerce. Business people understand how important a steady cash flow can be for your business. So farmers like that cash flow dimension, they may be raising walnuts or whatever, but that monthly cash comes in on alfalfa is a nice thing to have. And if you look at our balance of trade, having some dollars coming into this country is kind of a unique experience. Uh, we export less virtual water than we bring in. You know, there's 1,300 gallons of water in an iPhone. 
when you look about all the parts there. So it's, it's, I think virtual water is one of the most interesting things to look at. And as far as a policy question, I think there's going to be things talked about that for a long time to come. Thanks, Phil. It's one of my favorite issues. Yes, thank you, Phil, for that question. Does that, did I see another question as well? Yeah. Yes. You know, if you go to Phoenix or go to Vegas, you know, they just, on the freeway, they have colored rocks. They even put statues up. So I, I'm always puzzled. Why do we do so much planting along the freeway? It seems like the biggest waste of water ever. And a lot of times, the irrigation uh -huh. is... <laughs> Spraying out on the lake. Are, are we we're talking about alongside the roadway? Yeah. For the most part, and I can't guarantee it, for the most part, that's recycled water that's not potable. Okay. So you've got a sanitary district, takes the effluent, treats it, you got to do something with it. You can either ship it to the ocean in pipes, or you can reintroduce it to the ground, or, or you can water roadways with it. When you water the roadways, it keeps the dust down and does other things that have value, but I understand the consternation. Was there one more question? Oh, I see a question. John. No, no oh. not John. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone except for John. Okay, all right, all right. Dr. John. Ross can go. <laughs> Mr. Nick, um, a few years ago, I had the privilege of going uh, with Metropolitan Water District uh, up to Northern California, and we visited the Delta, and one of the problems they were having at the time seemed to be they were, they were considering this tunneling situation due to the smelt, I think they were smelt fish. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, uh, I haven't followed up on that. Has that ever gotten resolved? Or, or is this maybe a topic that we should do some other time? No, no. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> the state water project was started by Governor Pat Brown. Wow. <laughs> and the state water project would be the equivalent of a eight lane superhighway bringing water north to south uh, and except for the delta area then it turns into a two lane dirt road <clears throat> a bottleneck uh, it, it's it's tough to get water through the delta uh, there's a lot of reasons for that at one time the peripheral canal was a, a planned feature that was uh, ruled out so one of the best, most viable opportunities now is a tunnel under the delta. Uh, that area is certainly prone to earthquake. At some point, we're certain it'll happen again. And when that happens, there can be some disastrous activities <clears throat> that'll take place. The tunnel would help that. Uh, the environmental community has concerns about it. Uh, the fishing community has concerns about it. The people who farm the area have concerns about it. I can tell you that for over a decade we've done environmental studies on it. We've spent more than a quarter of a billion with a B dollars on that. And it makes me want to tell a story. <laughs> <laughs> Once upon a time in a land far away called California, there was a table in the middle of a kitchen. And on the table was a sack with $10,000 in it. Sitting around the table, was Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, and an out-of-work water lawyer. The lights went out. The lights came on. The money's gone. Who's got the money? Well, that's a trick question. There's no Easter Bunny. There's no Santa Claus. And as sure as the world is no out-of-work water lawyer. <laughs> the, the litigation on that tunnel is only surpassed by the litigation on the Colorado River. The Colorado River is the most litigated body of water in the country. Uh -huh. It is so litigious that the water master is the Secretary of Interior. Laws and water go hand in hand. Phil saying, I should have practiced water law. <laughs> uh, you Rachel. mentioned the Colorado River, and um, last year, I think in the summertime, we had heard that, of course, the water levels are reducing in the river, and I know a couple of states utilize the water resources, and we would heard maybe some states would have to cut back on some of the resources they utilize from the river. Can you talk about what that means for California, specifically Orange County, Orange? Uh, I don't know what it's going to wind up meaning, but I assure you it's what keeps water guys up at night. Uh, water people are very concerned about the Colorado. 
Colorado is a magnificent source of water. Uh, it services a lot of folks. Uh, the upper basin states, seven of them, uh, and, uh, total uh, western western states. Uh, we have been losing our share of water off the Colorado since I have been involved in water. Each year it seems to diminish a bit more. There are demands on that water <coughs> and we have to figure out how to make it work. I, I don't know that I've got good answers for you. We have answers that we try to come up with. For example, the Metropolitan Water District is the largest landowner in the um, Palo Verde area up near Parker Dam, I mean Blythe. <clears throat> we try to work with the farming community there so that we're not intrusive on it, but it's important that we have control of that land. We bought the land. <clears throat> because we are a public agency, we don't have to pay property tax. Okay. We're the largest landholder up there. We voluntarily write a check each year to the county for the amount of tax that they would have received had it still been in private hands. Because you've got to recognize that that is an impact to the people who live there and earn their livings there. We have a separate fund that helps fund other uh, enterprise there in order to help people develop a better life. And I can tell you that we put five million in that and there's more than five million in it today because they have administered it so well, loaning money to their own people to open a gasoline station, a tire store, a coffee shop. It's great. But the real reason we did it was not to be altruistic with your money out of our service area. The real reason we did it was to access the right to fallow that land. So we have farmers farming that land, but we can see in the future when we need more water because we're in a drought, in the future we're gonna to need to cut back some water we give them one year's notice that says next year you're going to need to fallow the land. We pay them, the same people that pay us rent, we pay them not to farm during that period of time. That replaces the income they would have received. But we take the water, send it right past the fields <coughs> that would have received it and bring it down here. We have tried every year to maintain the full aqueduct when we've needed to and every year we've managed to. Uh, we have water in the ground in Kern County. We have water in the ground in other places. We have along the Colorado River, besides ourselves, there are others who have stored water. We have capacity for six times the annual flow. So when we have a wet year, we, we try to put that water away for the dry years. And we've been for the past 20 plus years on the Colorado River in a drought condition. Uh, as you know, we've had a wet, wet season, and we're very grateful, and we thank you for that. But a friend of mine used to say, one monkey doesn't make a zoo. And one wet season does not offset years and years of drought. We've got to remember that people now have water bowls going down hundreds of feet in their wells that used to be 150 feet. Wow. You, know, you know how Fountain Valley got its name? Fountain Valley got its name because when they settled it, you could take a pipe, bang it in the ground, put a wellhead on it, and it would go artesian. Oh, wow. Fountain Valley. Before the Orange County Water District, the other district, the one that Dennis Billado represents, managed the aquifer so that in the 80s, they were popping swimming pools out of the ground because of the water pressure. It's an interesting subject. If you, The more you know about water, the more intriguing it becomes. Would you say that there's any concerns of aging infrastructure locally? I know. Well, uh, Jerry, do you still have any invasion pipe in the ground? Any what kind of pipe? After World War II, there was invasion pipe, pipe that had been rolled and made to use for occupation in World War II. Okay. But it's very thin. Uh, and there was a lot of that pipe that was put into work as homes were built after World War II. And it wasn't meant to last all this period of time. Uh, but there's some of that and there's other things. So yeah, there's a lot of aging infrastructure. Anytime you've got a, a city that's been around, so is the infrastructure. Right. And repair and replacement is an imperative. Going back to those leaks we were talking about. Mm -hmm. You've got some water, water departments that can lose over 15% of their water. Oh, wow. You know, when you're paying for 100 gallons, you'd like to get 100 instead of 85. 
infrastructure needs to be taken a look at, and uh, and of course it costs money. But Thank that's you. an excellent question. Thank you for asking. You're welcome. Another <coughs> question from I'll take somebody in you real quick, Phil. If I recall my public notices, we've got a water district notice uh, meeting coming up on the eighth or ninth. Is that correct? I that's saw a meeting on the first, but it's what? I don't know. I saw a meeting. I don't know. I saw. I I, I don't. Okay. I, I, I can't tell you. I know there's a meeting coming up. I did look at the website, but I, I, I don't remember when it is actually. Okay. I thought it was I thought it was Wednesday. We have yeah, that. Yeah, but I thought it was about water. I was wondering. Yeah, I was on the water district. The, page. Well, it's on our website. Is we have an annual meeting where we prepare to share with uh, the communities uh, our budget, and what we plan to do, and right. how we expect to approach the season for the following years. Okay. That's a public meeting we have in the evening that's coming up. Okay, maybe that was what it was, Matt. Are there any uh, desalination plants or technology investments coming down the pipe? <coughs> I hope so. I, I think the desal needs to have a part in our future. Um, the Metropolitan Water District, for example, owns some land up around Oxnard that has a footprint sufficient in size for a desal plant. Um, those of you who are following desal know that in Huntington Beach, they just voted down a desal plant in the city of Huntington Beach. Whether you liked it or whether you didn't like it, I can tell you that I've been involved in MODOC since 2000. When I arrived in 2000, there was a letter on the desk that said, this is the term sheet for desal water out of the Huntington Beach plant from the firm that was developing it, Poseidon. They spent 20 years that I know of, and they'd been doing it prior to that spending their time, effort, and energy developing an environmental impact report and lobbying activities to get the right to desal water out of Huntington. The California Coastal Commission, finally the last permit to be gotten. This lasted, you know, there's, not, there's so many permits to get. And it took so long that some of the permits were only good for five years. So from the time they got it until the time it ended, they had to renew the darn thing three times and go through this process again and again and again. I testified at the Coastal Commission and said that I thought they should give them the right to do so. That they should hold their feet to the fire and make sure any desal plant used the most appropriate and up-to-date science and that the environment is considered on the saline, saline discharge. Because if they gave them those permits, all they would have is the right to build. They're still gonna have to go out and talk to the cities and the water districts to see if anybody wants to buy the water. Because the water is expensive. It's very pure, and there are people who would like to have very pure water, high-tech people, the Silicon Valley types. Uh, but the marketplace would, Chamber of Commerce, the marketplace would dictate whether or not the plant was actually built. There is one built down in Carlsbad. Carlsbad was built by Poseidon, and it's the largest one in the country, I think. Uh, there's one that's <clears throat> being considered in Doheny Beach, that's a great idea in my estimation because Orange County's underlying geology, uh, you know where, roughly where the El Toro Y is, south of there, there's no groundwater um, this much, very little. So if you drill a well there, all you do is wear out drill bits. You get no groundwater. All of their water is imported water, which we provide and we're happy so to do, but wouldn't you sleep a little better at night knowing you had a base supply of water that you could make your coffee in the morning and that sort of thing? So a plant at the Doheny Beach would make great sense. It's a smaller plant they're talking about, but it's exciting. The engineers love this. Here's the beach, here's the plant, here's the ocean. They're gonna slant drill under the beach, out into the bottom of the ocean, bring the water down through the bottom, which will help get rid of critters and things of that nature, less entrapment and entrainment for live. Bring that water in. It'll cost more, because you gotta suck it down that way, but it'll be cleaner water, so it'll be less work to desalinate it. And I, uh, as I understand it, that's going clearly. It's a matter of getting the right players in place and financing. And I, for one, think it's a wonderful idea. And if I were the water czar, I would go up and down the coast of California and lock up every viable location for desal. Because once they build a Ritz-Carlton on that land, you're not going to be able to afford to get it back even with eminent domain. So that, in my opinion, would be the best approach, sir. We have time for one more question. Do I see anyone else with a question? I know, Phil, did you have one, Phil? 
or John. Mr. Dick, I have another question. In your opening remarks, you talked about a percentage of the electricity in the state, I think it was. I, yep. Uh, that we use just for water. And I was, if you could repeat that because I missed what the percentage was. 19% is the number I've heard. Now, I will also remind you that that is to move, treat, and dispose of. So that would include the, you know, when you turn on your water heater. Uh, but it's still an, an integral part of, uh, of water because it's so heavy again. It, it's 19% well, of all the water, I mean all the electricity that is produced? That's my understanding. I'm not in the energy business. They generate electricity <laughs> when it's going downhill too. They do. And, and we've done a lot of things through the years to try to be good stewards of our electrical grid. Uh, when we pumped water, for example, uh, we would try and we have in the past at pumping stations released water, which generates electricity, as you know, through the hydro. And then at night when electricity was cheaper, we would pump it back up out of a holding basin uh, that we would have, we would pay less to pump it back up than we would get paid to generate it on the way back down. So we lose some ability to transfer water, but if we didn't need it, to deliver it to your house, we could pump it back up and release it <coughs> the next day. <coughs> Excuse me. And we try to do that where and when we can. Once again, policy, politics, and people all come together in, in water. There was a situation where the government wanted to support clean, green energy. And there were some laws put in place that talked about what was green and they put limits on it. Uh, we actually, as I understand it, had to take one, one pumping plant offline or one uh, hydropower setup offline because it exceeded what they considered fair for green power. I mean, it's very hard for me to understand, but at that time it was in order to support solar and wind. I just asked Peter Hauser has a good episode on the water management Mr. Hauser was a good friend of water. <laughs> I do have one fun question for you. I like fun questions. <laughs> well, first fun question is how many grandkids do you have? I know that we were speaking earlier about you going to Grandparents Day. How many grandkids do you have? Four. Nice. Now, I wanted that sweatshirt that said, you can't tell me what to do. <laughs> You're not my boss. You're not my granddaughter. <laughs> have to get you that sweatshirt. <laughs> um, the other is, what is your favorite time of year in orange? Hmm. Specifically orange. Rainy season? Yeah. <laughs> what did she say? Rainy season. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I, I was raised, I was born in Missouri and raised there. there and uh, I came here in the Army. And let me, Brenda and I were talking about that earlier. Little, little, uh, plug for Brendan and, and uh, Congresswoman Young Kim. Uh, I got here and I said, holy cow, they've been keeping this a secret. <laughs> and I'm coming back. Uh, I'd seen California on television and things, but I hadn't ever experienced it. Well, 10 years later, I came back, had a wife and two kids. And let me tell you, I love every day in Orange. But if you look in the shed behind our house by the pool, there's a pole. Okay. On the bottom of that pole is a big square blade and it's kind of like a hoe if you know what a grub hoe is to get yeah. weeds in the garden on instead of being tilted it's straight. That's what I used to use in Chicago to break the ice up <laughs> after the storm. And anytime I complain about the weather, the smog, or the traffic, I can just open that, look at that, close the door, and smile. Thanks. <laughs> Every day in Orange is a great day. It's always a great day here, for sure. Well, we're going to go ahead and land this plane. I have some announcements before that. Do you have any last words for our business community? Uh, I mentioned earlier that your support on certain key pieces of legislation have been very important. I'd like to thank you for that in the past, and uh, please ask you to continue so to do in the future. Well, any time you have a question on that regarding whether or not you think you should support it, we would be pleased to respond. Thank you for that. Thank you, Larry. Yes, ma'am.
So just a couple of announcements, more than a couple actually. So we have our business networking group that's on the first and third Wednesdays um, at Zito's on Tustin Avenue. A lot of phones right now. <laughs> uh, the next one is a lunch and it's on, it's okay, Carrie, on March 15th. We also have a ribbon cutting at Big Al's Pizzeria on the 7th. We have our multi-chamber mixer after work hosted by the Garden Grove Chamber on the 15th. On the 23rd, one of our favorite events of the season is our City Council Breakfast Appreciation, or so our City Council Appreciation Breakfast. This year we're going to be honoring Will Steiner, so we would love to have you guys. Tickets are still on sale, so please, if you have any questions, talk to Elizabeth or Connie before you leave today. On the 25th, we have our Orange Plaza Art Walk. I know Dr. Oust is uh, sponsoring that, as long as the Potting Shed, right? Correct. Potting Shed, that's on the 25th. We have our next eggs and issues on the 28th. That's going to be Police Chief Dan Adams. I expect to see all of you back to talk to Dan. We have a chamber mixer with Clock Viet on the 30th. Then we have something we've never had before. I know Angie over here, I can see her on my side, is very excited about this one. <laughs> we have the Duke of Orange. Who here has heard of the Duke of Orange? Okay, good. You guys are all on our social media and all here doing all of the community things. So the Duke of Orange is gonna be on the 15th of April. We are still taking applications to, uh, to be in that contest and we're also still selling tickets for that. So we would love to have you. That event does support our next event, which is the May Parade. And that's gonna be on May 6th. We do have sponsorships that are still available for that as well. So we would love to see you at all of these events. As always, follow us on social media. Uh, make sure that you're getting our newsletters and that you are also an active member because that is how we support our business community. So with that, I will say thank you so much to Haven. I don't see Will, but thank you to Haven Craft Kitchen and Bar for hosting us this morning. Thank you to our Chairman Circle sponsors, our Board of Directors, our members, and our staff. And with that, we will see you next month. Thank you guys so much. That's right.